Okay, uh, Hamlet, Act Three, Scene Two, uh, aka the play within the play. Uh, the characters, uh, the, the the scene where the characters in the play watch a play. Now, this, um, as anyone who's messed with Hamlet in a, a classroom setting knows, is the scene that can get uh, a bit confusing in the classroom when people are just reading it on the page, you know, having to remind everybody, okay, you know, when it says king and queen, that's the actual king and actual queen, Claudius and Gertrude. Uh, but when it says player king and player queen, uh, those are the actors playing the king and queen in the play that the king and queen in the play are watching in the play. Um it's one of the places where it really pays to to see it performed. But you know, if you've stuck with this video series uh, the, uh, this far, you probably get the point. The people in the play are watching a play, so it's one of those story inside a story things. Uh, just like how there's you know a, a a a comic book inside a comic book in Watchmen, right? Someone in the comic is reading a comic. Um, now. Uh, uh, the the um, well f first thing uh, we want to uh, point out about three point two um, is that it begins with uh, what's called Hamlet's advice to the actors um, as the the first player is trying to uh, get into costume uh, as as the king for the play that the people in the play are about to sit down to, um, Hamlet is talking his ear off about the difference between good acting and uh, bad acting. Um, I speak the speech, I pray you as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. Uh, if you mouth it as many of our pl uh, players do, I just leave the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. Now, uh, here we see right there in black and white why it's uh, ironic that so many people today who are uh, you know, attempting to make fun of uh, Shakespeare or quote unquote Shakespearean acting uh, associate it with, you know, doing this thing uh, with your hand uh, because, well, here we have Shakespeare himself making fun of the, the idea of doing this thing with your hand. Even he thought it was lame. That, that was the style of acting, I guess, that had been current as, as Shakespeare was coming up that he uh, helped to, to overturn. Um, wanting uh, people in his plays to um, act more naturally, uh, soup the action to the word, the word to the action we see around line 16. Uh, in other words, don't, you know, strike all these unnatural poses, but make uh, the audience believe that you're, uh, you know, really this person really saying this stuff, you know, uh, the, the, the difference between if two guys are supposed to be having a conversation, do they stride to the front of the stage and both strike poses or do they, you know, look at each other, one hand in the pocket, one hand gesturing, like we're really seeing two guys have a conversation uh, in real life. Uh, now we, we can tell, um, forget about 400 years ago, even, you know, 100 or 70 or 80 uh, years ago, even just the time that, that there's been such a thing as movies, um, we we can get an intimation of the fact that this process of people um, uh, acting more and more, quote unquote, realistically, as opposed to, quote unquote, overacting, uh, appears to have been a process that, that has, has been continuing for as long as there have been actors and acting. Um, you know, everyone, especially young people, um, you know, show them a movie from, you know, 19... 1930s, and they laugh at how everyone is, uh, according to them, overacting um, as opposed to acting normal. But um, everyone uh, thus far has um, seemed to think this about the acting styles of the past. Uh, maybe, you know, the, the movies we watch today where we think people are acting quote unquote normal, uh, maybe. Uh, to the people here, you know, watching them a hundred years from now after we're gone, that will seem like overacting uh, to them. Um, who knows? Anyway, um, so uh, uh, here we see uh, Shakespeare, or I suppose Hamlet himself, 
uh, um, scorn this idea of overacting, thinking that it, that it gets in the way of the point uh, the scene is uh, trying to make. Um, anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as it were, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue or feature, scorn her own image in the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Um, uh, the idea that uh, anything that gets in the way of suspension of disbelief, anything that reminds us that it's just a play, that it's all fake, uh, gets in the way of what art is really supposed to do, uh, namely uh, this expression we recognize uh, uh, from today that all art here specifically plays, but as we use the expression today, all, all of the arts hold the mirror up to nature. You know, we see ourselves more clearly by seeing ourselves uh, uh, reflected in uh, art. Um, the, the idea that, that, that it teaches, it doesn't just entertain us, but uh, to a very real extent um, teaches us ethics, morality, right? Uh, shows virtue, her feature, scorn, her own image. Um, now, if you ask most people, where did you learn morality? Where did you learn the difference between right and wrong? Most people would say, you know, their parents or, or you know, rel from religion, if they practice a religion, maybe even from school and teachers, just a little bit, the distant third place behind parents and religion, I suppose. Um, not many people would admit uh, that they learned uh, ethics from TV and movies. Um, and if they did say so, people would probably think that their parents were not very good parents. But if we're being honest, that uh, those media do play uh, a big role in how we learn morality, or at least how it's um, impressed upon us, right? Those emotional reactions we have to, you know, um, uh, I wish I was like the good guy in this movie. I have to remember to act how he would act or do what he would do, or gosh, I hope nobody ever thinks I'm like the bad guy in this movie. I have to remember to not act the way he would act or do uh, what he would do. Uh, the acting out of stories, especially for young people, plays a huge role in how uh, morals, ethical behavior is uh, uh, inculcated. Um, it's how we emotionally feel it rather than just having it be a sort of list of you know uh, commandments or whatever, you know, do this, don't do that. And we see it dramatized. Um, now, uh, I've been, uh, regarding the first uh, two or so pages of this scene, uh, uh, referring to, to all of this as being uh, Shakespeare's opinion. Now, on the page, it is, of course, uh, Hamlet's opinion. Um, uh, uh, we, we must always remember uh, with, with Shakespeare that just as a general rule, um, you know, although everybody... Uh, is in the habit of quoting, you know, well, as William Shakespeare said, blah, 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 you know, like it, earlier in this play, as William Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. Well, no, Shakespeare didn't say that. Polonius said it. And maybe in context, it, we're supposed to take it ironically. You know, um, it, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful and also a frustrating thing uh, for Shakespeare fans that we find so many viewpoints about so many things expressed uh, so uh, uh, eloquently uh, and profoundly that, that for anybody who's arguing just about any opinion about anything, uh, you know, in a speech, in a, a paper for school, if you, you know where to look, you can find a quote where William Shakespeare will seem to be on your side, will seem to support your opinion. Um, but then if you keep looking, you might find another line or another speech in a different play or, or very often elsewhere in the same play where uh, a different character argues the opposite point of view just as as eloquently. Um, so, you know, wondering about, well, you know, which, which guy did Shakespeare agree with uh, can be very frustrating. There, we don't also have his, his diary, um, except for those people who consider uh, the sonnets to be his diary, but that that is highly questionable. Um, so we can never be 100% sure that just because such and such a viewpoint is what a character thinks, 
we can never be 100% sure that it's also what William Shakespeare thought. Uh, but there are a few leading candidates for places in the plays where uh, we can be, you know, as sure as we can be, you know, a 99.9 you know, with a bar over it, sure, uh, percent sure, um, that it, th this is basically William Shakespeare giving us his own opinion here. And one of those places may be the number one place in all the plays. Um, uh, where, where we can we can assume okay this is Shakespeare's own opinion are the first couple of pages uh, of Act Three, Scene Two of uh, Hamlet, where, where where Hamlet is talking about the difference between good and bad acting, and uh, uh, from there to what the point of acting and plays uh, is. Um, now, uh, uh, returning to as I advance in the video for uh, Act Two, Scene Two, uh, the theory that Shakespeare himself is playing the first player, uh, getting into to costume as the player king here. Um, we, we, we would, for the original audience at the Globe, have had the the hilarious visual joke of uh, uh, Hamlet uh, telling William Shakespeare his business, uh, you know, lecturing him about the difference between. Uh, good acting and, and bad acting while Shakespeare himself is saying things like, I hope we have reformed that indifferently with us, sir, you know, uh, uh, trying to court it, courting the approval of his own, his own creation. Um, uh, it, it, another in joke concludes this exchange starting at line 35. Let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them, for there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too. In the meantime, some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Now, that is uh, Shakespeare's uh, dig coming out of Hamlet's mouth, but William Shakespeare's uh, uh, meta-theatrical uh, uh, dig at a guy he used to work with named Will Kemp. Uh, as big Shakespeare fans probably already know, but real quick for everybody else, early in Shakespeare's career, the big star in his uh, the troupe of actors he worked with was a guy named Will Kemp, who did, oh, let's kindly call it broad comedy. Lots of, you know, catchphrases and falling down and you know, farting and pies in the face. Uh, and that sort of thing. Um, now, uh, that guy was a big star and he sold tickets, um, but he also it was also very frustrating for Shakespeare or for any writer to work with this guy, Will Kemp, because he would go off script frequently and start ad-libbing. Uh, and, and back then when, uh, when the funny guy, the clown and the troupe started ad-libbing, uh, people would throw money. And, and if he was having a good night and people were throwing money, the, the clown would stay out there forever. And he'd be picking up all the coins off the stage, but the play would get wrecked. Um, so so uh, as soon as Shakespeare was uh, enough of a name himself that people were coming to see plays because they were written by William Shakespeare rather than because they were starring Will Kemp, uh, Shakespeare uh, booted his ad-libbing ass um, and got you know new funny guys in there who were more uh, Robert Arman and uh, people who were more suited to Shakespeare's increasingly intellectual and wit based as opposed to you know sort of pie in the face falling down based uh, style of comedy. Um, and, and, and Shakespeare slash Hamlet tells us here the reason that clowns should speak no more than is set down for them is because even though it gets laughs, right, it's set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too, in the meantime, some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. In other words, even in the funny parts, it, it matters exactly how you put something because there might be some way in which the funny part thematically connects to the serious part. And what have we been seeing happen again and again uh, with this very play that we're in the middle of, not the exact middle of, as it happens. I'll get to that in a moment. This play that we're in the middle of now, we've been seeing ways in which uh, uh, questions raised by or themes introduced in or echoed by funny parts, uh, I suppose so far most uh, most notably uh, the first two thirds of act two, scene one, uh, Polonius's goofy plan 
to find out whether Laertes is behaving himself at college in France and the instructions to Ronaldo. It's a comic scene um, that appears at first to have nothing to do with the main plot, but the more we digest the questions that are raised by it, indeed, some necessary question of the play uh, be then to be considered in that funny part. That's the part that introduces uh, this idea of uh, the bait of falsehood taking the carp of truth. And uh, remember, as Hamlet is about to uh, remind Horatio when he uh, enters a moment later, remember what Hamlet is trying to do in this very scene. Take uh, a, 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 carp, a, a carp of truth with a bait uh, of falsehood. Uh, you know, get the king to give up his secret, uh, to, to catch the conscience of the king with the, by putting on a play or right? something that is fake, something that is not real. So the funny part introduced the phrase we use for what Hamlet is trying to do to solve the problem of the main plot here. So uh, um, levels within levels here of, you know, commentary on the play we're watching within the play as we get ready uh, for the people in the play to put on a play. Uh, oh, uh, I said to look out for the phrase piece of work again, back in 2.2 uh, when uh, Hamlet told us what a piece of work is a man, right? Uh, referencing humankind as a piece of work by God, a quintessence of dust. Uh, creation. Um, we hear in uh, line oh, uh, 42, as it happens. How about that? Ultimate answer to life, the universe of every and everything. Line 42, will the king hear this piece of work? Uh, Hamlet asks, referring to the play. So we have that same phrase, a piece of work, used to refer both to mankind uh, created by God and to a play created by man, right? This um, chain of creation, where, you know, God creates William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare creates Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, um, who turns around and creates uh, a play within his own play. Uh, remember, we're told toward the end of 2.2 that um, Hamlet is going to uh, insert a speech of some dozen or 16 lines into the murder of Gonzago, the play we're about to see. Um, and knowing Hamlet, who, who tends to keep going uh, when he's on a roll, uh, what, what he um, ended up inserting may have gone considerably beyond the promised dozen or 16 lines. Um, so w whether Hamlet wrote the entire play within a play, all of the uh, player king and player queen's lines uh, is, is something to think about here. Uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, Horatio comes in uh, and Hamlet reminds him uh, uh, and, and the audience um, of the plan here. Uh, there is a play tonight before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance which I have told thee of my father's death. I pray thee when thou seest that act of foot, even with the very comment of thy soul, observe mine uncle. Um, so, you know, when they get up to the murdering part, you and me are both going to uh, watch his face and... Uh, after we will both our judgments join in censure of his seeming, we'll uh, uh, confer after about w whether what we saw seemed to indicate guilt. So th this idea, we've got to prove he really did it. But before that, Hamlet gives uh, Horatio a, a rather long uh, digression on uh, BFFdom, um, why uh, Hamlet has picked Horatio for his uh, best friend and sidekick. Um, uh, one reason is, uh, well, the reason Horatio knows he can trust Hamlet, uh, is that Hamlet can't possibly be flattering him because Horatio is poor. Um, why should the poor be flattered? Know that the candy tongue lick absurd pomp and crook the pregnant hinges of the knee where thrift may follow fawning. Um, you know, someone, uh, uh, dishonest, someone disingenuous is not going to, flatter someone who has nothing to reward them with. They're only going to flatter someone powerful or rich so that they might be rewarded for their uh, obeisance. Um, now, uh, I want we want to follow that image uh, away because in, in the next scene, uh, this idea that um, of the, the candied tongue uh, licking absurd pomp and crooking the pregnant hinges of the knee where thrift may follow fawning is going to take on a very different meaning in act three, scene three, 
Uh, so remember those lines about uh, flattering the powerful uh, in the next scene. Uh, we, we get this idea of balance again. Blessed are those whose blood and judgment are so well commettled that they are not a pipe for fortune's finger to sound what stop she pleads. Uh, uh, Hamlet thinks that Horatio is a, a well-balanced man. Uh, give me that man that is not passion and slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core. Um, okay, cool. Uh, but it does uh, contradict, um, or at least not totally jive, with other things that uh, Hamlet has said about passion at the end of 2.2, in the, the very same speech where he came up with this, I'll put on a play idea. In the rogue and peasant slave soliloquy, he was beating himself up for not being passion slave. Uh, with all of that, uh, what's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? Uh, what would he do uh, had he the cue for passion that I have? Um, uh, Hamlet was, was mad at himself for not being emotional enough. Uh, and here he is uh, saying that the reason he admires Horatio so much is that um, Horatio does not let his emotions push him around. So um, as with certain other things, uh, Hamlet seems unable to make up his mind about whether it is a good thing or a bad thing uh, to uh, let your, your emotions uh, tell you what to do. I suppose as with so many things in life, it's convenient in some circumstances, but inconvenient in some other ones. Anyway, uh, everybody begins uh, taking their seats uh, and, and Hamlet uh, always uh, happy to have an, an audience for his jokes that go over everyone's head. Uh, he messes with uh, the other uh, dignitaries as they enter. How fares our cousin Hamlet, the king asks. Excellent to faith, Hamlet responds. Of the chameleon's dish, I eat the air, promise crammed. Um, referencing another uh, um, exploded medieval uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, truth, right? The idea that chameleons eat air. Um, uh, it, we, we had earlier in the play references to um, the retrograde motion of the planets, um, uh, to, to uh, a spontaneous generation, um, uh, to, to, to the, the uh, geocentric model of the solar system, a hot news of the day, right in the process of being overturned as Shakespeare is, is writing this. Um, uh, the, the, uh, go, go back and check out the video for uh, Act uh, 2, Scene 2, for more on the place of references to uh, uh, outdated scientific theories uh, in the play. It's sort of a running thing. Here we have another one, the idea that chameleons eat air uh, in line 88. Uh, the king responds, I have nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. In other words, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, Hamlet responds, no, nor mine now. Uh, in other words, you know, they're, they're, since I said them three whole seconds ago, they are now uh, no more my words uh, than, than they are yours. Um, another reference, uh, like uh, his, uh, no, not I, I never gave you aught to Ophelia in the previous scene. The idea, well, I'm a different person now. Here we have, this is, he's a different person than he was three seconds ago when he said the preceding line. Uh, also, I think in a neat psychological way, referencing that curious thing you notice about your own speech when you're a little kid and you play that game of, you know, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking. This is my voice. I can hear my voice right now. This is my voice. I'm talking, I'm talking. And then you stop and you're not hearing your own voice anymore. Um, the, the, the way we connect the sound of our own voice to some idea of the present moment and to a thing um, existing and then no longer existing, being and then not being. One of the first things we use to demonstrate that to ourselves is the sound of our own voice. 
um, Hamlet reminds us of this for me with a great deal of uh, a great deal of aesthetic pleasure there um, at uh, line line uh, ninety three or so. Um, Polonius uh, comes in, uh, and and we find out that when Polonius was in school, uh, when when he was a player in the university, uh, he did an act Julius Caesar. So Polonius has, uh, when he was younger, appeared in one of Shakespeare's earlier plays, more um, you know meta uh, meta theatrics, especially um, you know, and possibly some you know reactions, some turning around, looks of recognition on the actors. You know, getting ready in the wings as Hamlet and Polonius are having this conversation, um, since it was heavily implied back in 2.2 that it's the Lord Chamberlain's men, that it's you know William Shakespeare as himself, and you know some other guys as his actors, um, not his A-string actors because they would be in the actual play. You know, uh, you know the real Richard Burbage would have been playing Hamlet, but you know possibly some other guy dressed up as Richard Burbage playing Richard Burbage, you know, in the background while the real Burbage is playing Hamlet. Um, th this could have been uh, a, a enormous extended visual joke uh, in, in 3.2. Um, uh, Come hither, my dear Hamlet, sit by me, uh, his mother asks. Uh, no good mother hears metal more attractive. Um, Hamlet responds to his mom, sits down uh, next to Ophelia, and uh, commences embarrassing her with uh, an increasingly uh, elaborate uh, and filthy series of uh, dirty jokes. Uh, after you know, cruelly rejecting her in the previous scene, um, and and, and th this is. Uh, you know, later in most uh, most stagings and interpretations later that day. So she's probably still uh, smarting from all of this get thee to an unary stuff. He said to her, you know, earlier this afternoon. Um, and, uh, you know, here he is uh, sitting down next to her, flirting as though uh, nothing had happened. Lady, shall I lie in your lap? Um, you know, possibly punning on lie as in you know, to lie with it, 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 a sexual idea and lie as in uh, an untruth. Uh, do, you, do you think I meant country matters, punning on exactly what you think it is? Uh, that's a fair thought to lie between maids' legs. What is my lord? Nothing but punning on uh, no thing. In other words, the, the, the um, uh, traditional uh, sexist idea of anatomy uh, not, you know, differing uh, uh, genitalia, differing sexual organs on the male and female bodies, but rather just presence and absence, right? The presence or absence uh, of a penis, so all current all the way up through uh, uh, Freud and his uh, well into the 20th century um, sexist idea of, of, of anatomy, not as, you know, one thing and a different thing, but as a presence and absence, um, being and not being again. So sort of backing up the play's most famous line uh, from the previous scene uh, we're, we're with a, an extended uh, series of puns on the fact that uh, male genitalia is external and uh, visible and female uh, genitalia largely internal and uh, invisible. Um, no thing. Um uh, he, he continues from this, he, he transitions this metaphor into um, a metaphor on the, the nature of uh, shows and playing as, as the, the dumb show is underway, right? The actors in that long uh, italicized paragraph of stage direction, uh, the actors mutely acting out uh, the, the argument of the play, as Ophelia says in line 130. Um, Hamlet gets in another couple of, of uh, suggestive puns about showing. Uh, the players cannot keep counsel, they'll tell all. Uh, will it tell us what this show meant, Ophelia asks. Uh, I or any show that you will show him, he responds. Be not you ashamed to show, he'll not shame to tell you what it means. Um, you know, uh, with, with um, some echoing the idea of, you know, uh, things on a stage being visible, 
um, the, 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 the difference, the you know, Freudian, Aristotelian difference of visible, invisible, uh, uh, external, internal with uh, the sex organs of the uh, uh, different genders. Um, and, and a, a possible pun on showing uh, in, in yet another sense. I mean, we do after all observe that uh, when Hamlet embarrasses his mom at line 118 by saying, what should a man do but be merry for? Look you how cheerfully my mother looks and my father died within two hours. Um, Ophelia immediately responds, nay, tis twice two months, my lord. In other words, it's been about four months uh, since uh, his father's death, which means it's been um, possibly a little uh, uh, under, under three since the play started. Uh, Hamlet telling us in 1.2 that it is uh, nay, not so much, not two uh, months since his dad's uh, death. In any case, uh, Ophelia, uh, certainly hyper aware of exactly how many months have gone by for some reason. More on that uh, uh, in Act 4, Scene 5. Anyway, um, she'll mark the play, and now uh, so will we. Um, the, the, the player king uh, begins at around line uh, uh, 143. Um, now this is, uh, if we count up the, the total number of lines, uh, there were 4,070 or something, uh, 4,072 by most counts, uh, this is very, very near the exact middle of the play. Um, so the, the play within the play, this exchange between the, the player king and player queen, uh, I think is, is um, I don't know whether he counted lines, but maybe just counting by pages, uh, deliberately put by Shakespeare in, in the dead center um, of the play. Remember how important uh, uh, the, the center was back in uh, uh, 2.2, again, that monster scene that holds uh, so much. Uh, Polonius promises us, if circumstances lead me, I will find where truth is hid, though truth were hid indeed within the center. Um, punning there on uh, the, the uh, current astronomical uh, controversy about what's in the center, uh, the, the, the earth or the sun, you know, the earth like the scripture says, or or the sun, like science says, um, uh, th th this this metaphor of the center as containing truth. Uh, we we have here the the play within the play um, occurring in the exact center of the play. Um, we have uh, uh, for the first a couple of exchanges. Um, uh, and nothing much more than uh, the king in the play, in the play saying to the, the, the actress queen, or I guess boy actor and drag queen, if we said it in the Middle Ages, um, I'll be dead soon, you should remarry. And the queen saying over and over and over and over and over, um, no, I could never do that. Uh, culminating in, in second husband, let me be accursed, none wed the second, but who killed the first in lines uh, 167, 168. Um, now, uh, presumably this would be uh, something since it's, you know, overdone, um, you know, ironically, the, the scene begins uh, with, with Hamlet uh, warning us against things that are overdone or anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing. And yet here, possibly uh, courtesy of Hamlet's own hand, we get something very overdone um, thrown in to, to embarrass his mom. Uh, Hamlet, who, uh, despite the fact that th this is instrumental to the whole catching the conscience of the king plan, uh, Hamlet for some reason cannot stop heckling his own play yelling stuff during it, refusing to shut up and let uh, let the, the uh, play do the play's job, to let the play be the thing. Uh, at around uh, line 217, yells, Madam, how like you this play? Uh, to which Gertrude responds with her most famous line, the lady doth protest too much, methinks. In other words, she's saying uh, this, I could never remarry stuff over and over and over so much um, that you know, we, we if it begin to doubt, she means it. Um, like she's trying to convince herself 
Um, now, the player queen is certainly not the only character in the play who's guilty of that. Hamlet himself, uh, we see, um, with regard to revenging and, and other things, tell himself that he doesn't believe it himself and he's trying to convince himself more than us. Uh, but the centerpiece of the whole play within a play and possibly uh, the centerpiece of Hamlet as a whole um, uh, would be the player king's long speech beginning at line 174 with, I do believe you think what now you speak. Uh, now, this play, the, the whole thing, I mean, not the little one inside the whole thing, uh, the, the, the play is so um, endlessly uh, rich, rewarding, profound, multifaceted. I mean, it's got, it addresses pretty much everything to do with the, uh, just the concept of being a human being who is alive um, at, at one point or another. Um, so there is no one line or one speech in it that uh, uh, is, you know, the point of the whole thing. But if we had to pick one, it might be, I think, even even more so than the much more famous to be or not to be speech from the previous scene. If we had to pick one speech that might be, you know, something like the answer, the key to the whole play, I think it's the Player King's speech and how appropriate, uh, what an appropriate, you know, uh, Easter, an appropriate joke to this play about playing, this play about theater that you know, the answer is given by you know, the actor playing an actor you know, in a play in the play. I do believe you think what now you speak, he begins, but what we do determine oft we break. Purpose is but the slave to memory of violent birth, but poor validity. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, what, what we end up actually doing, actually following through on depends on us remembering, not necessarily retaining, but at least remembering the emotional state we were in when we came up with the idea to do it. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you get a paper back and, and see that you got a, a you know, a, lower grade than you anticipated because your grammar was bad and you tell yourself, oh, that's it from now on, I'm going to study grammar for an hour every night. And you mean it when you say it, but you know, you get home that night and you're tired. You tell yourself, oh, I'll study grammar for two hours tomorrow night. The next day, something else comes up. And before you know it, you've studied no grammar at all. Um, but you really did mean it when you said it because you were uh, uh, caught up in the emotions of getting handed back the bad grade and, and seeing it. You know, we make, promises when we feel an emotion and then when the the emotion goes away so does uh, uh the promise um uh, or as the player king puts it what to ourselves in passion we propose the passion ending doth the purpose lose uh you make a promise when you're all emotional when the emotion is gone so is the promise now we've heard this echoed before um uh, again, in a, a, a comic way, courtesy of Polonius at the end of 1.3, um, you know, uh, telling Ophelia not to trust Hamlet, uh, you know, uh, I do know when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. In other words, I was a young guy myself once. I know that when they're horny, they, you know, what, they'll promise you anything to get you uh, into bed, but don't believe them because when they have satisfied themselves, that their promises will be worthless. Um, and more centrally, Hamlet himself, furious at uh, his mother's, as he sees it, broken promise uh, to, to love his, his dead father forever. Um, the player king understands that this is a, that you can't, you know, make a law about an emotion, whether it's, you know, a prescribed period of mourning or a wedding vow, or, or whatever, you, there's no such thing as a contract or a law to have an emotion forever. The domain of laws and contracts and the domain of emotions are uh, non-overlapping magisteria. Um, yet rather than being uh, outraged by this, the player king accepts it. 
He calls it necessary. Most necessary it is that we forget to pay ourselves what to ourselves is debt. You know, that's life. Um, you know, in, in a way that, that anticipates, you know, uh, John Lennon's famous line, you know, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Um, you know, the, the, the truth of, of that sentiment demonstrated very well by this play, among, uh, among other things. Um, the, the player king, rather than being outraged by this, like the young idealistic uh, philosophy nerd, Hamlet, the player king, seems to accept it. Um, but orderly to end where I begun, our wills and fates do so contrary run that our devices still are overthrown. Our thoughts are ours, their ends, none of our own. Our wills and fates do so contrary run. In other words, what we want to happen and what ends up happening is so different that our devices still are overthrown, uh, that our plans are always wrecked. Our thoughts are ours, their ends, none of our own. You know, we can say that, that we own our thoughts um, and have control over what they are as long as they're just thoughts, but you try and put them out into the world, make a plan, you know, put them into practice, and what's gonna end up happening is anybody's guess. Uh, you know, this, you know, even dove, dovetails with the, uh, in, in the previous video where we were discussing the metaphoric, the non-literal reading of to be or not to be as, you know, rejecting the world or participating in it, um, you know, turning the other cheek or taking up arms, you know, against the bad guys, against the bad stuff in the world, running the risk of possibly becoming bad yourself because you don't know how it's going to end up working out. You know, you, you try to do good. You can never be 100% sure that what's going to end up getting done is good. But is that an excuse for not trying? Um, our thoughts are ours. Their ends, none of our own. Uh, and then maybe the play's most most central distinction, you know, thoughts versus actions. Uh, what Hamlet ends up concentrating on in that very famous speech of his from the preceding uh, scene, um, echoing also, you know, who we are when we're alone, our soliloquy selves versus who who other people uh, uh, know us to be. Um, you know, based on what we do, this echoes well. Um, Batman, among other things, right? You know, how many times do we hear that? Uh, what is you know, it's uh, it's not who I am on the inside; it's what I do that defines me, right? That that it's not who you are in your heart. You you, you know, you 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 are judged ultimately. You, you are the meaning of your actions, what you actually do. And this, uh, long before Batman uh, made it a thing, uh, was a uh, Catholic versus Protestant thing. Uh, one of the religious quibbles, uh, Easter eggs, jokes, riddles, paradoxes uh, in the play. The, the um, uh, Protestant idea of salvation by faith alone, it's what's in your heart that counts, versus the Catholic idea that faith without works is dead. Oh, it's not enough to just have all the faith in the world in your heart. You've got to do stuff. Um uh, so, so the 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 prince's paradox, the, the the prince's predicament, echoing in in many real and deliberate ways a a religious argument that had consumed uh, England for the better part of the the, the previous century. Um, so uh, Gertrude uh, points out that the lady doth protest too much. Um, Hamlet continues with the uh, heckling of his own play, uh, directing uh, his, his wisecracks at this time uh, at the king uh, around line 227. Uh, tis, tis a knavish piece of work, but what of that, your majesty, and we that have free souls, it touches us not. In other words, uh, a lot of bad stuff is done in this play, but hey, you and me haven't. Uh, done any bad stuff, right? Why should we be bothered by it? You know, really trying to uh, it, it interfering really with his own plan, uh, like warning uh, the, the, the king um, about uh, uh, you know what, what what he's trying. What should be a surprise here? Uh, just as you know, in the previous 
seen uh, Hamlet's uh, whole, you know, pretending to be crazy thing, if that's even what he was doing, ends up having exactly the opposite effect. The first thing Claudius says when he comes in after Ham Hamlet put on all the to be or not to be and get thee to an unnery is what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. The, the king's immediate reaction is that guy's not really crazy. Um, so uh, uh, if pretending to be crazy and was, was actually ever what Hamlet was doing, apparently it bombed spectacularly. Um, he's in the process of, of seemingly about to make his own put on a play plan bomb spectacularly as well. Yet somehow, despite Hamlet's own best efforts to talk over his own actors in the play that possibly he wrote, a uh, very important question there, again, whether we are supposed to believe that Hamlet himself wrote the play within a play, because if he did, um, it's, it's pretty profound that the player king says a bunch of stuff that Hamlet himself appears to not realize. All of this most necessary tis that we forget to pay ourselves or to ourselves as debt. You know, it's okay. It's part of life to break promises, especially to yourself um, or, to, or to this. Our devices still are overthrown. Thoughts are ours, ends, none of our own. This, these appear to be the very things that Hamlet himself doesn't know. So if Hamlet wrote that speech, wrote the thing that the player king says, in addition to being a great visual joke where you've got, if I'm right, that Shakespeare himself played the player king, we have it right in the middle, in the exact middle of the play, this amazing visual joke where you've got uh, William Shakespeare in a play by Hamlet, just as the rest of the time we have Hamlet in a play by William Shakespeare. Uh, we, we also have the idea that somehow Hamlet, when he's writing, knows something that he doesn't know the rest of the time. It's not up here. It's not in the forefront of his mind, but somehow he knows it subconsciously. Shakespeare anticipating this idea of, you know, um, what would, I suppose, beginning with you know, Keats at the tail end of Romanticism, you know, 200 years later, and continuing on to, you know, confessionalism in the, the mid 20th century, this idea of poetry as, as therapy. Uh, of the point of, of writing um, being uh, at least on some level for the writer themselves to get out something that they're unable to get out any other way, to, to speak something or to admit something that they wouldn't be able to speak or admit the rest of the time. Um, if Hamlet himself wrote the play within a play, that's what he's done. Uh, there was while what he thought he was doing, what his plan was, was to embarrass his mom, uh, the, the, the central point of what he ended up doing was, was, was reveal that he knew that broken promises are natural and plans are pointless, all the stuff that the player king says. Um, and then I guess went right back to forgetting that he knew that, um, or maybe embarrassed by the fact that he knew it. That could explain why he keeps yelling stuff during his own play. Anyway, um, uh, despite uh, Hamlet's own best efforts to wreck his own plan, uh, at line uh, 250, the king rises. Uh, he, he, he was apparently so consumed or so surprised uh, by guilt or by the coincidence of seeing the ear poisoning reenacted re on stage. Uh, Claudius leaps up with a guilty expression on his face, uh, causing Hamlet uh, famously to quip, what, frighted with false fire? Um, a few meanings crammed in there. False fire would mean uh, blanks and uh, empty cartridges um, used for salutes like, oh crap, now that I think about it, the kind being referenced in the very last line of the play. Um but also uh, possibly the, the false fire of hell, right? Which was uh, um, theologized to give heat without light. Um, uh, and finally, and most literally, the, the false fire of the play, you know, spooked by a thing that is not real. Um, the, 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 the 
bait of falsehood revealing the carp of truth, right? The, the, the what's on the, the inside, the king's secret has been uh, extracted um, by the thing that is not real, uh, the talent of, of the actors, the lowliest in terms of station in life um, characters in the play doing a carnival style uh, role reversal on the, the mightiest uh, character in the play, the king. Uh, the, the talent of the actors extracting the secret uh, of, of the king, who then gets his own double meaning line, uh, give me some light uh, away in, in 254, meaning literally, uh, you know, that's enough of this play crap, turn up the lights, this play is over, uh, but also quite possibly meaning um, give me some light as in uh, uh, the wondering uh, if and how he can ever again attain the light of God's grace or God's forgiveness or, or the, the light of heaven, as opposed to the false fire darkness of hell referenced in the previous pun. Um, you know, being reminded uh, thusly of this terrible thing he's done, he's worried about the fate of his immortal soul. Um, everybody leaves uh, and Hamlet uh is is celebrating, you know, you know, embraces Horatio, uh, uh, jumping up and down, you know, it it worked, it worked. Um, would not this sermon of forest of feathers, if the rest of my fortune turned up with me, with two provincial roses on my raised shoes, get me a fellowship and a cry of players? You know, look at this amazing play I just put on, this amazing plan I just executed perfectly. Um, Good Horatio, I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pound, didst perceive upon the talk of the poisoning. Um, so uh, how we should be taking this, Hamlet's elation that the plan has worked, um, is that, okay, now you definitely proved he's guilty, and now you're going to go kill him, right? Now the play should be, what, what is it going to end in two or three more pages? Uh, you can kill him now, right? I see that it doesn't end in two or three more pages. So why not? You did what you, the, the one thing you said you needed to do first. Um, but uh, in, in his um, exuberance, Hamlet decides to spend a few pages doing uh, his two favorite things, uh, messing with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, followed by messing with Polonius. Uh, the two of them come in uh, to tell him that uh, uh, the, the king is, is, is pissed off about the Hamlet's stunt or as they put it, the king is in his retirement, marvelous distempered with drink, sir, Hamlet responds, uh, punning on the king's uh, uh, fondness for his liquor as referenced in uh, uh, 1.2 and, and 1.4 with the king's rouse. Uh, no, my lord, with choler, meaning with anger, uh, Gil Stern responds. Uh, and Hamlet, in a way that goes over everyone's head, uh, responds, your wisdom should show itself more richer to signify this to his doctor, for for me to put him to his purgation would perhaps plunge him into far more choler. In other words, if I uh, uh, purged him, uh, punning on to make him puke and to send him to hell, you know, th then he'd really be angry. It would plunge him into far more choler. Uh, so if you were... Uh, in the market for a, a pun on <laughs> making a drunk person puke and uh, sending a murderer to hell, uh, there's one. Use it uh, as you see fit. Um, the uh, uh, page and a half of messing with uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern um, uh, culminates in, in the uh, wonderful, do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe exchange? Um, uh, Hamlet uh, uh, grabs a, a flute, a recorder from one of the passing uh, musicians, um, and as Guildenstern is trying to get Hamlet to uh, uh, take their embassy from the king seriously and to calm down and uh, talk sense, Hamlet protests at line 330, I do not well understand that. Will you play upon this pipe? Uh, Guildenstern repeatedly protests, my lord, I cannot. Believe me, I cannot. Uh, but Hamlet was just setting him up uh, in uh, 337. Well, it's as easy as lying. Govern these vintages with your fingers and thumbs. Give it breath with your mouth. It will discourse most eloquent music. Look you, these are the stops. Guildenstern responds, I, these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. And that's when Hamlet uh, uh, trips the hammer. 
Look you now how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me for my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there's much music, excellent voice in this little organ, yet cannot you make it speak. Splud, i.e. God's blood. Do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you fret me, yet you cannot play upon me. So this very extended and very brilliant metaphor uh, uh, refers to, well, an expression we still use uh, today, right? To get someone to confess something is to make him sing. Hamlet is playing with a similar uh, idea here. Hey, you, know, you guys were here to spy on me. Um, to to uh, pluck out the heart of my mystery, sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. Um, do you think I am easier to be playing? And you, you came here to do that, yet you protest that you can't even play a flute. Do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Do you think it would be easier to get music out of me, easier to make me sing than it would be to get music out of a little inanimate object? Um, you know, Excellent, uh, well set up, uh, extended uh, metaphor. At that exact moment, um, Polonius comes in and Hamlet goes right back to pretending to be uh, completely out of it. Do you see yonder cloud that's almost in the shape of a camel? Um, he thinks it's like a weasel uh, or like a whale and Polonius you know, keeps agreeing. Uh, Tis backed like a weasel, very like a whale. Um, and th this brief exchange um, where Hamlet knows he can make a, a character of lower station agree with nonsense, you know, kiss up to him and agree with nonsense. So we get a taste there of um, the same joke in more extended fashion with uh, Osric um, in, in, in the, uh, the play's very last funny part uh, in, at the beginning of Act 5, Scene uh, 2, with the... Uh, taking on and off of, of the hat. Uh, I will come to my mother by and by. Everyone leaves and Hamlet gets uh, the, the briefest um, of his soliloquies. Tis now the very witching time of night uh, when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Uh, now could I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quick to look on. In other words, uh, you know, now it's it's midnight. Um, you know, now now it's, it's now I can really do some killing. Um, you know, we we've heard th this idea of, of um, midnight being the, the time for murdering. Uh, and, well, elsewhere in in uh, Shakespeare, uh, Macbeth uh, references it in the uh, is this a dagger I see before me uh, speech. Um, and we also know that midnight is the time when uh, the ghost appears, uh, referenced here with this churchyard's yawn. In other words, graves give up their ghosts. Um, except he continues, soft now to my mother, heart lose not thy nature, let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. Uh, in other words, but I, even though it's midnight and it's murder in time, I better calm down because I have to go talk to my mom and I have to not kill her. Um, uh, let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. In other words, don't God, don't let me end up like Nero, the Roman emperor who killed uh, his mother. Um, in all fairness, she tried to kill him first. But anyway, um, I will speak daggers to her, but use none. Uh, Here's the thing, though. Instead of saying, I have to remember not to kill my mom, sh shouldn't he be saying, time to go kill Claudius? That was the point of th this whole scene, right? Putting on the play within the play. It worked. He jumped up. He looked guilty. Uh, now you can go kill him. He starts this speech like that's what he's going to say. Tis now the very witching time of night when Churchill of John Heltzell breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on? And we're going, for example, killing Claudius, which we're, you're going to go do right now because the play worked. And instead, what he says is, time to go not kill my mom. 
okay, I, I guess. What about Claudius? Are you even going to mention him in this? No? All right. You're the prince. Um, you know, and, and uh, a, a, in the very closing lines here, uh, Shakespeare through Hamlet, bringing us full circle to the beginning of the scene. Look how uh, these, these lines, my tongue and soul in this be hypocrites, how in my words so never she be shent to give them seals, never my soul consent. Um, you know, I, I'm going to um, speak daggers to her, but use none. I'm, I'm going to talk to her in the meanest way possible, but I'm not going to back it up with action. Look how this line, my tongue and soul in this be hypocrites, echoes and is the very opposite of suit the action to the word, the word to the action. Hamlet's advice about acting uh, at the beginning uh, of this scene. Um, yeah, yeah, another contrast that cements this, you know, running, this very running um, uh, a joke, uh, pun on, you know, acting and acting, right? Acting in the sense of you know, being an actor on a stage in a play and acting in the sense of actually getting something done, acting in the sense of an action. Uh, anyway, even though he's on his way to not kill his mom instead of uh, on his way to go kill the king, um, fate presents Hamlet with a perfect opportunity to do the latter in the very next scene, 3.3. Um, uh, when on his way to go not kill his mom, uh, who should Hamlet uh, pass but Claudius, who is alone, unguarded, has his back turned, is not paying attention. Um, yet once again, uh, Hamlet does not kill him. Uh, we'll find out why not uh, in the video for Act 3, Scene 3. See you then.